that's the background stars for every 24 hour period. And so uh, if you chop that into 24 hours, then that means the moon is moving about half a degree every hour. Uh, the size of the moon as it appears in the sky is half a degree. And so the moon basically moves one width of itself every hour in the night sky. So that's pretty fast compared to the background stars of the sky. And night by night, you'll see that the moon um, makes progress against these stars and it completes a full circuit in roughly a month. Uh, we'll get more of that later. But something interesting uh, happens in many cultures around the world, and that's that uh, you might be familiar with the solar zodiac uh, constellations like Scorpius and Sagittarius, uh, Libra, etc. Uh, these are the 12 constellations that the sun passes through over the course of a year. And so uh, the constellations are, are not evenly spaced, um, but it's often said that the sun spends a month in each constellation. Um, that's not actually true, um, but on average, 12 constellations for 12 months of the year. So what happens is that you can do the same thing with the moon. So since the moon orbits the earth in 27.3 days, then the moon can pretty much be tracked as it goes through the sky and it can be said to stop each night in a different portion of the sky. Uh, and so over time, what's developed is a collection of 27 or 28 um, stars or, or, or small groupings of stars uh, that can be called a lunar zodiac. Uh, and this is found in many different parts of the world. Um, in India, this is known as the nakshatras. Uh, in Arabia, uh, this is known as the manazil or the manazil al qamar which means the stations of the moon. Um, in China, this is known as the lunar mansions uh, or lunar houses. Uh, and this goes back even to uh, ancient Babylon um, and even is connected to ancient Egypt as well uh, with the 36 decans, uh, which is a slightly different system, but based on, on a similar premise. So let's take a brief look at uh, what this actually looks like in the night sky. So I'm just gonna make sure that we're here in real time. And uh, there we go. All right. And uh, let's flip back just for a moment to that full screen view of our eclipsing moon. It's really getting gorgeous. And we can see that the moon is just uh, really getting that beautiful red color. Um, it's almost a pinkish color. Uh, that very bright portion on the left of your screen, uh, it looks washed out. That's the part that is still fully illuminated by the sun. On the right-hand side, that's the part of the moon that is actually inside Earth's shadow at this point. Um, and again, the color here looks reddish because uh, even though it's uh, technically in Earth's shadow, uh, the Earth's atmosphere is refracting some of the light from the sun around the Earth um, to go back uh, inside our shadow and illuminate the moon with that reddish color. Really beautiful. So let's take a, a look at what happens here as the moon moves across the night sky. So uh, if we can go back to uh, the Stellarium screen, I just want to confirm. Yes, excellent. Uh, so here we've got the moon. And again, this is pretty much right now. Uh, the moon is here next to the Pleiades star cluster. But if I go up to my date and time window, I advance us one day. Now we see that the moon is next to uh, the Hyades star cluster here in Taurus, and this bright star, Aldebaran. 
Now, uh, my expertise is in Arabian astronomy. And uh, this Pleiades star cluster was known as a Thoraya. Um, and it was a really celebrated star cluster in Arabia. Uh, here, uh, tomorrow at this time, uh, for us here in Arizona, 1.30 in the morning, um, the moon will be near Aldebaran. And that also comes from the Arabic. Uh, it means the follower. And it's the follower of the Pleiades uh, because it comes right after the Pleiades star cluster. So then let's say we go another day, right? And so the moon has moved another 13.2 degrees in the night sky. And we see uh, that it's by um, another star here. And um, it's getting almost uh, at the level of Orion over here. And so if I continue to advance this, you'll see the moon will go step by step every day, 13.2 degrees. And so the moon, as it's going through its phases, is actually making progress against the background stars of the night sky. So this is the first thing uh, we're looking at here is the progress of the moon against the night sky. And remember that because that's going to come into play uh, later on when we uh, look at another element. So let's uh, go back to our full screen view of the moon. And we're making really great progress again here. The eclipse is advancing. Uh, we've got this uh, really beautiful pink color uh, coming out. It's a, it's a bit more pink than uh, reddish orange and that's because um, it's still quite bright. And yeah, you can just see beautiful detail on that shadow side of the moon. Beautiful. We really looked out here in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, the weather forecast was calling for much cloudier skies and uh, we really ended up with a gorgeous view of the moon. Wonderful. Okay, um, let's take a look now. Uh, we're gonna look at another element of how the moon moves. And this is an interesting one. So uh, let me go back to my star map here. Again, I'm using the program Stellarium. Uh, that's a free download from stellarium.org, I believe. And let me just make sure I'm at our current time, excellent. Okay, so again, this is uh, the current view of the moon in the night sky. And the second thing we're gonna look at here is that uh, the phase of the moon uh, determines how long the moon is visible in your night sky. And uh, this is gonna make a lot of sense. So let's actually start where we are right now. Uh, we're looking at a lunar eclipse and by definition, uh, the moon and the earth and the sun are lined up uh, and that's called syzygy when these three bodies line up together. Now for there to be a lunar eclipse that can only happen when the moon is a full moon. And so uh, tonight, right now, uh, we have a full moon. And so uh, what this means, if you think about it and the, uh, these different celestial bodies in space, this means that as you're looking up at the eclipsed moon, uh, if you go outside, for example, then when you're looking at the moon, the sun is directly behind you, right? So the sun is illuminating the other side of the earth right now. It's daytime there, it's nighttime here. And then uh, the moon is passing right behind the earth into our shadow. So um, some people ask, uh, why don't we have a lunar eclipse every time the moon goes um, uh, or every time the moon is a full moon? And the reason is that um, 
our, uh, our celestial bodies have to line up exactly in all of the axes. And so even though uh, every time there's a full moon, we have this um, event called syzygy, the moon has to also be um, inside the cone of Earth's shadow. So that means that uh, if you look at the orbit sideways, then um, one can't be above the other. And so most times when we have a full moon, uh, the moon is a little bit above um, the plane of, of our orbit around the sun um, or a little bit below. And that's what pre prevents it from going into a lunar eclipse every single time. So here we've, we've got this uh, full moon. And so by definition, um, when we have a full moon, it's opposite the sun in the night sky or the daytime sky. So when the sun sets, the full moon rises in the east and the full moon is up all night long. And when it sets in the west, the sun is rising in the east. Okay, so full moon, you get the moon all night long. Now, what happens in the other phases that the, mo the moon goes through? Well, uh, let's find out here. So we're going to go to uh, the very next uh, new moon uh, or the very next visible crescent after an astronomical new moon. So in our simulation here, we'll just hop over to December 5th and take a look at what we get. Now we're going to have to change our time here. So we'll go through day of time. And then we can see here we've got the sun, the moon. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, so we'll go to, uh, yeah, this is good, um, 5.30. This is about 15 minutes after sunset on December 5th. And so you see we've got a moon here. But if we zoom in, you can see that this moon is a really tiny crescent. I mean, it's barely visible. Um, in actuality, you might not be able to see it. It may be too faint. So let's see what happens on the next day. 12.6, a little bit of a thicker crescent. Now, this moon, if you can see the um, the, da the data here on the left-hand side actually says that this moon on December 6 will set at 741. Um, so with a sunset at 515, a moon set at 741, that means we've got about two hours of the moon uh, after sunset and then the moon's gone. So when we have a crescent moon, the moon is in the sky much less, only a couple hours compared to a full moon, uh, like tonight, where the moon is up all night long. And so this is a really interesting uh, uh, feature of the lunar phases. And as we go through the phases, you'll see that we've got more moon. So we can advance, say, three more days. Now we've got a moon that is six days old, and it's going to set at 11 p.m. at night. And so uh, here we've got uh, five hours, 20 minutes, something like that um, before the moon sets. And so uh, as that phase advances, the moon is up for a longer portion of the night. Now, this feature of um, uh, or this relationship of the moon's phases to the length of time that it was up at night actually found itself into uh, a series of uh, Arabic sayings about the moon. So I'll read a couple of them to you, and you'll get a sense here that these sayings are really referring to the length of time that the moon is visible, um, not as much um, so to the face directly. So um, the first one says, that um, when it's uh, the first night, and here the first night means the first night that the crescent is visible. So that technically could be a maybe a three-day-old moon, maybe a four-day-old moon in some cases. And so on that first night, um, 
it's compared to a little lamb, uh, the owners of which have rested in a small tract of sand. Um, and so that means uh, the, the little lamb uh, doesn't want to wait long before it wants to eat again. And so that's the crescent. Um, it's just a really short period of time. Now, if we fast forward um, a couple days, then uh, let's see here. Let's try. Uh, let's try the fifth night. So when it is five nights old, um, then uh, it's the time for discourse and sociability. Um, and so here we're talking about a longer period of time where people can have conversations. Maybe it's a few hours. Uh, as we progress through the phases of the moon, um, when the moon is seven nights old, um, it's the night of um, the night journey of the hyena, uh, which is a longer period of time. And so now uh, perhaps that's a good six or seven hours that the hyena is journeying through the night. Um, when the night is nine nights old, um, at this time, onyx is picked up in it. And this is partly because it's so bright, um, but also because you have plenty of time to search for it. And then um, when the moon is full uh, on the 10th night, and of course here, this is the 10th night after the crescent is first visible. So uh, this would be a 13 or 14 day old moon. Um, at this point, then the moon welcomes the dawn. Uh, and that goes right back to what I said earlier, that with the full moon, it's up all night long and it sets as the sun rises. So this is just a little piece of um, Arabian cultural astronomy that talks about how uh, the phases of the moon are related to the length of time that the moon is up in the night sky. So let's uh, go back to our full screen view of the moon and see where we are. And we've got just a small sliver now of the moon oh, looking gorgeous. Right now, uh, local time here in Arizona, it is 1.40 a.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time here in the United States. So we are about 23 minutes away from uh, maximum eclipse, which is going to be almost a total lunar eclipse, 97% uh, uh, towards totality. And that is just a gorgeous, gorgeous moon. Okay, um, so we're going to look at one more element here. Uh, in the night sky in uh, looking at how the moon travels through the night sky and how that uh, has impacted different cultures. So um, this is a, an interesting piece. Um, because the moon moves against the background stars of the sky, as we've seen before. Um, and let me get us back to our time right now. And we'll just zoom out. There we go. There's the moon. Get that centered. OK, very nice. So because the moon moves against the background stars of the night sky, um, there's something interesting that happens. Um, the moon uh, has this odd 27 and a half day uh, cycle. Uh, in terms of how it orbits around the Earth, um, but its phases take 29 and a half days. And that's because as the moon is orbiting around the Earth, at the same time, the Earth is orbiting around the sun. And so by the time the moon has come back to its original place with respect to the Earth after 27.3 days, the Earth has advanced in its orbit um, over that same period of time. And so the moon needs an extra two days, a uh, little bit more than that, um, to get back to the same point.
point in its phase cycle. And so that difference is part of what causes um, the, the moon's phases to progress uh, over the course of months and years as it travels against the background stars. So uh, that means that the moon alone is not very good at predicting annual cycles. Um, if it gets cold every winter, um, if it rains um, in the same month every year, the moon alone isn't really good for predicting that because it's too variable. But because, uh, as we saw before, because a crescent moon, a young crescent moon, can only appear low in the western sky, then if you watch actually a star or a star cluster, perhaps, and watch how the moon um, changes its phase each time it passes that star or star cluster, you can use the conjunction of those two bodies to create a seasonal calendar. Um, and this is exactly what some cultures have done. Um, in uh, ancient Arabia, um, as well as some modern uh, areas like uh, Yemen, um, Afghanistan, uh, even East Africa, you can find what's called a moon Pleiades conjunction calendar. So again, tonight, if we zoom in here, the moon is undergoing its eclipse right near this Pleiades star cluster. So uh, this, is, this is the view now. This is the view tonight, right? And we've got a full moon, which happens to be going through an eclipse by the Pleiades star cluster. Now, if we watched what happened next month in December when the moon gets near the Pleiades, what would we find? Well, let's take a look here. So I'm going to go, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one month. And we've got the Pleiades down here. So let's back up. All right. So we've got the moon near the Pleiades on December 17th. But here, the moon now is 97% illuminated. So this is what we would call a gibbous moon. It's not all the way full. Let's go another month. All right. So this is another month and let's get the moon near the Pleiades. Now at this point uh, in January, the moon is now 80% illuminated. Uh, this is also gibbous, but uh, if we zoom in here, you can see that it's um, moving towards a half moon. And so what you'll find is that if we advance month by month by month, every time the moon passes the Pleiades star cluster, its phase gets smaller and smaller and smaller until uh, I'll get to the end here. Uh, right at the end of April, uh, and let's center on the moon. Right at the end of April. Oh, and let me change the time. Whoop. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here we see that the moon is quite close to the sun. And then here at the early part of May, and let's get to nighttime. One more hour should do it. There we go. So now we've got a young crescent moon. Uh, this is only two days old. This is May 2nd. And this will be uh, that first brand new crescent moon um, that we'll see uh, joining with uh, the Pleiades star cluster. And there we, there we go. We've got the Pleiades there. Um, yeah, May 1st or May 2nd. They're kind of similar here. So basically, this shows how you can create an entire seasonal calendar 
just out of the way that the moon joins with a specific star as it goes through its phase changes month by month by month. So uh, these are three different ways that um, the moon moves across the background of the night sky. Um, and these are different ways that different cultures around the world have used these motions to tell uh, time through the night or to tell uh, time through the seasons of the year, um, all using uh, the changes that we see in the moon. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing uh, this uh, view from the Stellarium program. And let's catch up on where we are with our moon. Gorgeous. Uh, we're now about 15 minutes away from maximum eclipse. And we just have a tiny sliver of moon left here. Awesome. All right. Um, well, let me just check here and see if we've got any questions that have come in. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Oh, uh, one question, did the Arabs call it the beaver moon too? Uh, nope, <laughs> no beavers in Arabia. Um, they are indigenous to North America. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, uh, there's a question, how much is the temperature dropping on the moon because of the eclipse? Um, so the moon does not have an atmosphere and um, so that means that temperature extremes are, are quite significant. And uh, when the moon goes into the Earth's shadow, uh, you basically lose all of that heat really quickly. So um, that would be a, quite a rapid change. All right. Uh, we've got some questions. Um, is this safe to look at? Absolutely. So we're looking at a lunar eclipse here, not a solar eclipse. And that's a big difference. So uh, all the light you're seeing right now on the moon is reflected sunlight. Uh, so it is completely safe to look at. You do not need any kind of solar glasses. All right. Oh, uh, another question, why can a lunar eclipse only happen on a full moon? Okay, great question. Um, this is because by definition, uh, a full moon happens when it is directly opposite the sun in the Earth's sky. And so um, what this means is that uh, for the moon uh, to be opposite the sun, uh, that means it's on the shadow side of the Earth. And so a lunar eclipse can happen only when the moon is passing through the shadow cast by the earth um, uh, due to the sunlight that's coming at the earth. So it can only happen during a full moon. Um, by the same token, solar eclipses can only happen during a new moon um, because in that case, the moon is on the other side of the earth the illuminated side of the earth. And in, in a solar eclipse, the shadow of the moon is falling on a, a much smaller portion of the earth. All right. And so uh, we are approaching, looks like we're about 12 minutes away from maximum eclipse here. Uh, and we're coming at you live from Flagstaff, Arizona, from Lowell Observatory. And wow, we have just got a gorgeous, gorgeous moon here and a beautiful night. Uh, another question, how often does a lunar eclipse occur? Um, so it's not uh, exactly regular. Um, as mentioned before, whether we get an eclipse or not depends on uh, whether the moon is passing through what's called the nodes um, of its orbit around the earth. So as the moon orbits the earth, sometimes it's above uh, the plane of, um, 
the earth as we're traveling around the sun. Sometimes it's below. <clears throat> so as the moon um, gets to that point of being full, we only get a lunar eclipse if it's passing through the nodes and it's exactly in the plane um, of the Earth's shadow. Uh, let's see. Uh, does the moon get as red as Mars? So the color of the moon during a lunar eclipse um, depends a lot on local factors. So it can uh, appear as red as Mars, absolutely. Um, it depends on uh, things like uh, particulates in the air. Um, if you have air that has some smoke in it, you'll get some uh, a much deeper, darker uh, red moon. Um, whereas if you have, um, uh, say, a lot of uh, water vapor, uh, that will affect the color in other ways. So it can get uh, as red as Mars. And uh, ours is currently looking um, rather pinkish. Uh, which is quite a beautiful color, I think. All right. All right, so um, I'm going to um, uh, sign off myself here and we are going to welcome back um, Rezi and Sarah, I believe, together uh, to give us an update on how we're doing and what's coming up next as we approach maximum lunar eclipse uh yeah <laughs> i don't i don't know if uh i'm i'm on yet sorry yeah i can i can talk a bit about because i've got um my eyes on the moon as well as the camera you're seeing um and uh yeah it looks real nice it doesn't from your eyeball look this pink i'm intentionally overexposing it so um, in the camera so that you can see some of the detail in, the, um, in the, the features on the moon, it's actually much darker. It is that orange color, uh, that darker orange, and even um, pretty dark gray that people were talking about earlier. So I think what we're gonna do now is uh, toss it over to John Compton, who will talk a bit about um, some of the, the geology of the moon and uh, we'll keep him apprised and let him know when we're hitting maximum. Um, John, are you ready? Just about? Maybe. Um, we do have a, a, a minute maybe um, while John's getting ready here. Um, oh yeah, he's got, oh never mind. He's got 10 minutes. That's my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we had a little break in there for a second, but things got a little turned around, but. Yeah, so um, Oh, no worries. Um, yeah, so I actually I just snuck outside to take a look at this. And you're right, it doesn't look quite as pink as it looks in the video that you're taking right now, Sarah. Uh, but you can definitely still make out some of that coloration, uh, which is is really, really nice from, from here at least. Uh, so yeah, you can tell that we're getting really, really close. I'm interested to see how much is left of that little tiny sliver of very illuminated, that like 1% of the moon that's going to be still illuminated tonight. I haven't mm -hmm. um, haven't seen an eclipse quite like this before, so I'm excited. Yeah, and sorry, John, I realized uh, it's about time for us to take just a little moon break. It's not quite time for you yet. That's my bad, I got my, my times mixed up. Um, so yeah, so what I think we'll do is we're just gonna let you watch the moon and we will pop back on in about five minutes when we hit maximum and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, and then after that, if you wanna hang out, uh, out with us and watch it sort of recede from maximum, John's gonna talk a lot about um, some fun geology stuff about the surface of the moon. So uh, we will let y'all just enjoy and we'll be back in just a couple minutes.
Okay, everyone, it is now 2.02 in the morning, at least here in Arizona. Um, if you're on the East Coast, you might actually be up for like a real reason. Um, <laughs> but two in the morning is just a weird time. But anyway, we have now reached maximum eclipse. Uh, Rez, you want to talk about what that means and what's going to happen next? Yeah, so basically what's happened here is we have entered into, well, the moon has entered into the Earth's shadow as much as it is going to tonight. Uh, so tonight, right now, we're at about 99% of the moon is in that shadow. <laughs> um, and what we're seeing for the most part here is this pink color, right? This happens with lunar eclipses. Um, and what's happening is the light that is hitting the moon um, is being filtered through the Earth's atmosphere, right? The Earth is perfectly in between uh, the moon and the sun. So normally the moon is, uh, when it's full, white uh, because of that sunlight reflecting back uh, from the sun onto the Earth. Uh, today, though, that sunlight isn't hitting it directly. The Earth is in the way. Uh, so that light is being bent, and we're seeing all of this red. Um, now, since this is the furthest into the shadow that the moon will be tonight, what that means is from here, we're going to pretty much see the reverse of what we just saw. Um, it's going to start getting lighter and lighter. That illuminated patch is going to get bigger and bigger, and it will go back to regular normal moon colors pretty soon. Um, so yeah, that's what's happening right now. Um, actually, I'm I'm not on Mars Hill right now where the observatory is, but in my own little neighborhood, I just took a peek outside and it's it's very cute. Like all of the neighbors are outside looking <laughs> at the lunar eclipse. So I think uh, pretty much everywhere we're- uh, About another half hour, well, not even quite, 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes of um, talking to do. And then uh, we'll probably go to bed after that. But um, for now, I think we will turn it over to John, who's going to talk about the, some geology shenanigans on the moon um, and really whatever he wants to talk about. So have fun. Hey, thanks. Um, hey, nerds. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, you know, at the end of the stream. Um, so uh, definitely throw all your questions, all your remaining questions in the chat, and I'll try and get to whatever I can, um, whatever I know about. Um, most of my knowledge of the moon is, is uh, the features we see on the surface and the geology, but I can touch on some other stuff if we need to. Um, yeah, I, it, it's a gorgeous looking uh, eclipse right now, so I, I don't, I don't want to use you know, a presentation or anything. Let's just roll that beautiful moon footage. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a tale of the moon. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, th this whole story, you know, uh, how the moon formed in the first place is a lot of what we, you know, see on the surface. So um, about four billion years ago uh, it was the Hadean time period on Earth, right? Um, four, four and a half, um, somewhere around there, right? And Earth was basically just a ton of lava, ton of lava and lightning. Um, so appropriately named the Hadean time period, right? Uh, and you know, it was partially differentiated, which means, you know, it started to separate into layers and things like that. And along comes this huge, uh, you know, other body, right? This thing the size of um, the Mars, right? Uh, and it's called Theia, right? Uh, which is the name for the mother of the moon, uh, in, in old mythology. So um, it comes along and it sideswipes Earth, right? And it just blasts um, a big old uh, stream of just Earth off into space, right? Uh, glancing blow and it kind of keeps going. So this stream of debris, this stream of molten uh, bits of the Earth itself sort of formed a ring around the Earth for, you know, a while until it started to condense back down and, and coalesce um, coming together as the orbit kind of, or as the, the rings kind of caught up to each other. And um, that accreted, it, it formed together into the moon, right? So the moon was a piece of the earth at one point, but it wasn't like a chunk of the earth. It was um, bits of molten earth that were splattered off into space and then kind of like coalesced in this ring. There's a couple other theories, but this is the one that um, has the most amount of proof behind, right? Um, it has the most traction, I suppose. Uh, so um, this piece piece of the earth that once was, um, you know, when things accrete, 
right? When things come together like that, they get really, really, really hot, right? And so the moon was also just a giant ball of lava at that point, um, something like uh, 10,000 degrees Celsius, right? Hot, 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 hot. Um, and, you know, it remained molten for a really long time. Um, and uh, when it had formed, it formed really close to Earth. Um, oh, that little small moon around the moon. I will, I will touch on that. Uh, so, uh, good question. Thank you for the questions. Um, so, uh, the moon was like, a tenth the distance that it that it that it is now. So, like the moon was right in our face, um, and so this uh, gravitational pull from the Earth. Um, so the moon is lava, right? Earth is lava, but it's bigger, uh, bigger lava, um, and it basically stretched out the moon towards us, right? So the the axis is kind of pointed our way, and it's not a huge amount, but it's basically a squished little football shape and we're looking at it. Um, and this is, you know, caused a lot of the effects for how we got tidally locked and things like that. Um, but, uh, so the moon is still just a big ball of lava though. Uh, and you know, over time, uh, things start to cool, right? And you start to, um, cool these things like olivines and pyroxenes, like these heavy, um, they have like a lot of iron in them, a lot of magnesium, things like that. They're almost all silicate. So they start to um, uh, crystallize and sink as they cool because they're heavy and they form like this little uh, mantle area down there. It's still pretty, pretty ductile. Um, and then, you know, over time uh, we get like these feldspars, um, anerthite um, or uh, anerthetic rocks start to, to cool and they float to the surface, right? And you can see it on the moon. Um, when we talk about like the highlands or those high areas, the white areas of the moon, um, we're talking about that, that anerthite that floated to the surface like a foam and it kind of cools and um, solidifies into these, these cool ranges, right? So why do we see the other, um, the darker materials, right? That should be that iron, um, uh, iron rich should be basalts and, and the olivines and things like that. Probably not the pyroxenes. Um, well, uh, the late heavy bombardment happened, right? So, uh, we started getting all of these impacts all over the earth and all over the moon. Um, and big impacts, bolide impacts, um, all across the surface. And you can see them in these dark patches. Uh, well, you know, these impacts hit, but it's still a pretty ductile moon. It's still pretty soft and squishy inside. And uh, so we get a lot of lava, right? A lot of um, these sort of like, uh, what do you call them? Um, like really, really liquidy flood basalts kind of start flowing out and filling in the areas. Um, and uh, they fill in all the low-lying spots, right? So it takes a bit to cool and it's very, very liquidy. Um, Miss Mosmo, yeah, so is the Earth. It's awesome. Uh, uh, the question was, um, wait, the moon used to be a floating mound of molten rock? Yes, indeed. Um, so uh, the these low-lying areas caused by the crater impacts and some other ones um, in certain areas uh, filled in with lava, like a, 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 an ocean of lava, right? And we call them the mar, right, which means the seas, right? So you get like... Um, Sea of tranquility, sea of uh, rains, the ocean of whatever, right? Um, they're all named after oceans. And they were, for a long time, oceans of uh, heavy metal lava. Uh, and it, they kind of smoothed it out and filled in the cracks. And uh, you can even see in this image um, some little embayments, uh, things like that, as it made little coastlines and things. And it filled in the areas and that um, sort of like anerthite, that soft um, uh, foaming uh, sort of material that crystallized first or crystallized later onto the top. You can see them poking out in little island chains um, across the surface. Um, so we get the late heavy bombardment. We get all these lava flows, right? Um, and the moon is still cooling. So we start to get some other interesting features. Um, one of them is you'll get these like little track lines kind of going across. They look like little railroad tracks everywhere. Um, and these are from the moon, like uh, 
the moon's surface shrinking, right? And it kind of um, shrinks in, but there's nowhere to go. So it just kind of forms little cracks um, in, in these little zones. Uh, but then the big one, right, the big features are the uh, new impacts, right? These more recent ones, as you can see, uh, one down there at the bottom, you can also you see Tycho and Copernicus pretty well right now. Um, and these these are more recent impacts, right? So they're not filled in with lava. It's not that um, the basalt was excavated during these earlier impacts. It's they were, they were filled in. But now that the, the moon is cooled, right, um, it's, it's pretty solid except for uh, maybe a, a molten-ish core of iron. I think it's a little bit debated. But um, these new impacts don't excavate anything. They just hit, right? And you'll see all of these ejecta lines kind of streaming off from the impact site. You can really see it well um, with uh, Copernicus down there. Um, so these, these ray lines are how we sort of track the ages of some of these, some of these impacts because they, they lie over each other and they'll fade over time. And uh, we can sort of see which ones happened when. But... Um, for the longest time, a lot of these craters were thought to be volcanic, right? They look a lot like a caldera. Um, a caldera is just kind of a collapsed volcano uh, or, or a collapsed, um, what do you call it, mass of, of something underneath the surface that, that didn't quite breach the surface, right? And it cools and so it collapses on the surface. Uh, it looks a lot like them, right? We see a big ring. We see terracing along the, the uh, inner edges of the ring where it's sort of collapsing in this little stair steps. And then we see in the middle this um, sort of resurgent peak, right? Um, and so people thought, oh, like, that's, that's a caldera. Uh, but then when we started doing research about these sort of the, the heavy bombardment and seeing like how big these, these impacts really could be, because people thought, oh, they must be side glancing. It can't be like that. But no, these were energetic hits. Um, and so the, the terracing is as it sort of like collapses in on itself. And then the resurgent peak is that, you know, some of these things hit so hard, it compresses the ground in these huge areas and it ripples the ground like it's water and it kind of gets stuck basically. Um, there's some other features where it kind of pops itself back up, but uh, we get these um, really, really cool craters. I know there's a question earlier about erosion on the moon. Um, yeah, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, and because it's completely cooled, there's no tectonics anymore. So we don't really get the same types of erosion, right? We don't get, there's no wind, there's no water, um, and there's no tectonics for, for mass motion, so nothing's kind of getting big and falling apart. It does still get impacted. And so we can get local erosion from, from an impact and it kind of moving off. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll get, we'll get bits of erosion like that, but, but the regolith on the moon is really spiky, um, sharp little grains. The, the regolith is basically like the sand of the moon. Um, and so it, they tend to be little spiky ones because there's nothing moving them around to round them off over time. So they kind of stay put. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna look through the questions real fast while I've got a sec um, before I move on to some of my eight, my other favorite uh, lunar features. Um, thanks for sticking around, you lunatics. Um, let's see. So I don't know a lot about this other small moon that's been in the news. Couldn't really tell you. I don't believe that it would have much of an impact on. Um, like tidal effects and things like that. Uh, so, and one of the, you know, there's always the question of like, if the moon is leaving us, what will happen to our tides? And the sun also has a, has a decent amount of tidal effect on the earth, especially from a geologic standpoint. So, you know, we'd still have tides, they'd just be solar. Um, don't know when that is. Uh, so what are the darker areas of the moon composed of? And are those leftovers from when it crashed into the earth? So the dark parts, again, are those, those lava fields. It's the, the inner surface of the, the moon remaining liquid for so long that it sort of sprung out of these big crater impacts like an artesian well, just like trickling up and out um, and kind of filling it in. In some areas, you can see what looks like wave patterns 
forming. Um, those those are more of those wrinkle ridges where um, it cools and kind of deforms because the highlands are gonna are gonna shrink in different ways than the, the mar, and so you kind of get this ripply effect. They look cool though. Um, they definitely make it look like an ocean. Um, <laughs> let's see what else we got. Um, could we have asteroids from the Earth Gaia splat um, uh, hiding out in space? Um, bits of each more and uh, less mixed. Um, yeah, probably. Uh, you know, it would have been a very, very energetic hit. It would have been something like um, an object 90% the size of the Earth hitting the Earth. Um, some stuff would have been shot out. Who knows? what would have come back by now um, and who knows what's still out there looming in the distance as a signature of Earth. Um, uh, if someone were on the moon right now at this point, uh, what would they see from their point of view? Um, I think they'd see a, sort of a solar eclipse probably. Yeah. That's my guess. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rocks guy. Um, how do um, uh, objects like moons and planets end up perfectly round? Um, it's just gravity, right? So things want to be evenly distributed. Like, so if I build a sand castle, eventually it will kind of fall down and flatten out. And um, if you do that from every angle, it just becomes a ball. It's just falling in from all over the place. Um, hmm. Is it true that the moon is female? Um, yeah, traditionally, uh, we said Luna, you know, the goddess, um, the goddess moon and the um, god's son. I don't know why. Um, yeah, so the, so the Earth used to have a ring, um, uh, especially had a ring of bits of moon, um, which were bits of Earth. Uh, and even from a solar perspective, the moon is basically touching their Earth. It's really close. Like 250,000 miles isn't much. That's how far a Jeep Liberty can drive in its lifetime. Like, um, it's like right there. And it, even, you know, at the beginning, 25,000 uh, miles away, that, that's, it's right on top of us. It's a bit of us. Um, let's see. Erosion, mini moon. Um, the moon would have had small tectonics at one point, not not in the same sense that we have, where we have these huge plate motions, but just um, as the surface shrunk, it would have there would have been some a small amount of motion. Um, now a lot of that uh, is mostly detectable in those wrinkle ridges and things like that. Um, and but we do have a fair amount of grobbins, like these horse and grobbin structures, which come from like pull apart features. And so the only way to get pull apart features is to have like regional tectonics going on. Um, <laughs> have these impacts affected the rotation motion? Um, <clears throat> probably not to a detectable degree, but everything has an impact. Uh, especially uh, meteorites. Okay. Um, I did not. Thank you, Jelsomerus. <laughs> um, is the moon ever going to disappear? So um, the moon is leaving us, but it's not leaving us quickly, right? It's it, it leaves at about the rate that your fingernails grow. So every time you clip your nails, think, oh, goodbye, goodbye, moon, a little bit further away. But that's that's slowing down. So eventually. <clears throat> it will, <clears throat> excuse me, it will continue to slow down and it will find some sort of equilibrium distance away from us. We'll, we'll get less wobble. Um, it'll be like truly tidally locked and um, it'll be kind of this, this far away distance as it, as it kind of orbits around us. Um, can the moon crash and wipe us out? Oh, I hope not. No, um, no, absolutely not. Um, it's, it's, uh, we are trying to throw it away from us as hard as we possibly can. Um, uh, but Earth's gravity <clears throat> kind of is pulling it, pulling it towards us, but uh, Earth's gravity is losing that fight and it's, it's slowly leaving. Um, nothing's gonna kind of change that. Um, the last, when was the last meteor impact on the moon? All the time, like all the time, all the time. Um, little tiny guys, I think the last big one was probably Copernicus or Tycho. 
um, uh, because those are the ones with the most sort of vibrant of the ray patterns coming out, out of them. Um, I don't know much about Moonstone. I think it just looks like the moon. Uh, is the roundness of the moon an optical illusion? We see a round ball because it's a system shape we want to see. No, it's 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 a pretty it's pretty round, um, and you know the 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 deformation that makes it a football is aimed at us, right? So if you could turn, if you could get around to the side, in theory, if you had good instruments, you could see that it's sort of this oblate, sort of spheroid kind of shape, um, and uh, yeah. Um, hmm. Have you ever seen asteroid impacts from your telescope? Not me. I'm not cool enough. Um, uh, yeah. So some other interesting features. Um, I've got my little my little notes here. Um, we've got yeah all of these little bays in the lunar highlands. Um, and if you take even your 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 own telescope and and go look on a clear night, um, you can you can see a lot of these these interesting features. Um, the impacts. Um, there was a question about the other side of the moon, like the dark side of the moon and what it looks like. So it's, it's heavily impacted. Um, but, uh, this side of the moon has all of the Mar, right? And a lot of that is, um, gravitational pull, right? Uh, magnesium, iron, heavy, um, uh, and they, they kind of bubbled up into these really early huge impacts. Um, and the sort of like that, what do you call it? Like this, this uh, ductile mantle area is a little bit offset towards us. And so it kind of pops out a little bit easier. The, the, the dark side of the moon looks just like a big piece of pumice. Um, it's, it's got that it, mostly anorthite, right? So it's just white rock with tons of craters in it. Uh, why are most impact craters on the side of the moon that faces us? It's pretty, pretty well distributed, I'd say. I, I feel like the, the backside, if you look at it, you can see it's it's pretty beaten up. Um, it's it's had its fair share of, of impacts coming in. Um, does the moon spin? Uh, it does, but so do we, right? And it rotates around us at the same rate that it spins. That's that tidal locking thing. So it's rotating but at the same rate that it moves around us so it's almost like it's um keeping one side always facing us and that's partially to do with um some fun physics and partially to do with it's got an offset sort of core and it's it got this this stretched out you know face so if you remember weeble wobbles it's kind of like weeble wobbling at us they just don't fall down um Yeah, so uh, some people believe that um, uh, there are other theories about how the moon was formed, but a lot of um, the proof of why the moon came from Earth is, um, oh, and someone just asked that exact question. Um, they are, it is compositionally almost identical, um, especially to the time period when um, uh, the moon was formed. Um, well, uh, I think that's most of the questions. So I, I appreciate your time. Ask me fun things about uh, my my favorite uh, little piece of the earth up there. Okay, thank you, John. So um, I believe it's now time for us to wrap up the stream. Not that the eclipse is ending, um, but we're tired and we want to go to bed. Um, <laughs> Rezzy, um, do you have no, we had a question of uh, when the eclipse ends, how much longer has it gotten it? Do you happen to know that? Um, so about the exact same amount of time has led into it. So if you were watching from the beginning of the stream, I think we started how, <laughs> how long ago now? Uh, that was a hours and change ago. So it's probably got about, yeah, two hours to go out of the partial. And then they'll have a little bit of penumbral residual, but that's hard to see even at the best of times. So yeah. the good part will probably last another hour or two. Yeah, which is cool. That's one of the cool things about this one is that it's very long for a partial eclipse, mm -hmm. um, which makes it pretty neat. Yeah, so I think uh, I think with that, guys, we will uh, bid you farewell. Thank you for joining us on this early morning or late night, you know, whatever, whatever your life's about.
<laughs> um, and uh, we will see you um, on our next stream. So uh, have a great night, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much for watching.